Welcome to Brevis Talk. The talks you are about to hear will be honest, revealing, and unfiltered. Join us as your host, Pastor Wayne Whiteside, lifts the lid of silence and has conversations about mental illness and health in the church. The goal here is simple. It is to help someone along this journey of life who is struggling. It is to tell the truth to the unsuspecting, and it is to lighten the load of a fellow traveler. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to serve as medical advice or to replace consultation with your physician or mental health professional. If you are experiencing a medical crisis, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Now, here's your host, Pastor Wayne. I want to welcome you back to another Brevis Talk. Thank you for stopping by. If you hear rumbling in the background, that is the sound of of thunder. We are receiving rain currently in our area, and we are very, very grateful for every drop that God grants us. Let's begin with a scripture reading in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, And difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then on to verse 21 to 23, the Bible says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Very, very clear. Well, so many places to go and so many directions here. Let me simply begin by saying that uh, there have been some great, great things happen of recent in prison ministry, and there have been some not so great, great things happen recently in prison ministry. I'm of the opinion currently, and I don't know how this turns out, that there is a young man who formerly I had seen much growth in the Lord, who is now, for whatever reason, pushing away all those who have sought to help him and have helped him. And I don't understand uh, what's going on there. The devil in his deception is very able to lead someone astray. And so I ask you simply to pray for this man, and I'm going to call him Chi-Town. And so you pray for Chi-Town that... uh, whatever turbulence he has, whatever confusion he is having currently, that God will uh, move in his life and he will come back to the place and the path uh, that he was on. I like in prison ministry, and if you've been around me, you've heard this statement, it is a glorious, hard time. Sometimes in dealing with, well, just anyone, people, but uh, especially it seems like prisoners with the mental illness and the challenges there, uh, it's, it's like nailing jello to the wall. It's not clean. It's not a one-size-fits-all type uh, presentation of the gospel. And so you see things, you say, well, that guy is totally changed and totally transformed And then later you question that and you ask, uh, you know, what happened there? What, What really, really happened? Now, I am a person who believes that if Jesus Christ comes into your life, that he is a destiny and he is a life changer. I do not believe you can call on the name of the Lord in sincerity and repentance and stay the same person in your life that you formerly were all of your life. I do realize that growth is a, it's staggered, that some people grow more quickly 
into Christian maturity than others. And I do realize that we've all had the experience of playing the prodigal as far as uh, going to those faraway places and having to come unto ourselves to to have an epiphany of sorts in the pig pen. And so I get all of that. But somewhere in the walk, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You may disagree with this. Uh, You have every right to. Uh, I'll still stand on what I'm standing on. I believe our churches... Evangelical churches are full of lost people. I'm not saying most people are lost. I'm just saying there's a mission field there because there are individuals for different reasons have joined the church and have never been born from above. They've never been born a second time. I can't tell you the number of times that I've counseled with people who will say, well, I I followed a friend down the aisle in an invitation when I was seven years old, didn't have a clue what I was doing, just thought I'll go with my friend, and the next thing I know, they're filling out a card, and they're processing me. That's my word. They didn't use that. And uh, they're scheduling me for water baptism, and I don't have a clue about God, repentance, sin, Jesus, But they signed me up, and here I am years later. uh, God is doing a genuine thing in my life. It's real. I know who God is, and I know that God has a plan for my life. So explain the former things to me. Explain all of that. I had a man that told me one time, I can't be baptized a second time. I can't. I was baptized when I was young. And of course, then he said, I'm, I was saved. I was born again. And yet I can't be baptized a second time. Well, I said, well, the first one didn't mean a thing. I mean, if you didn't have Christ in your heart, if you're not already a born again believer before you go into the baptismal waters, all you got was a public bath. Baptism does not precede salvation. Water baptism is post-salvation. It is an affirmation. It is saying to the world, I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. It is a public proclamation. It is the first step in obedience after you have come to Christ Jesus. That water does not wash sin away. If your sins have not been removed Before you get into that water, you remain in your sins when you leave that water. That is crystal, crystal, crystal clear in God's holy word. But I want to take you to a story that is a heartbreaker, a lot of deception, really no success in this story, and yet I remember the beginning of the story so well. I had encountered and visited a man on death row in Texas and had a few visits, nothing really more than a cordial hello. And so I received a call. I was eating uh, the evening meal. We call it uh, supper in the South. I guess you may call it dinner. We call it supper. And I received a phone call from a fellow volunteer. And this individual relayed the message to me that this this guy's going to be executed within 14 days, and he has requested that I be his uh, spiritual advisor, that I be there in the last days, that I be there with him the day of his execution uh, up until, you know, an hour or so before his execution, and then that I would be a witness uh, to his execution. I was very much caught off guard and surprised because, again, I'd only had a couple of very quick conversations with this man, nothing of any depth or detail. And so he had requested me, put put my name down in his official paperwork. And so I was really surprised, to say the very, very least. But I I made my way over to the prison uh, before the last day there, a week or so before, and had a conversation with him. He didn't really care to hear anything I had to say about the gospel, Jesus Christ. He simply didn't want to die alone, 
Number one, he did not want to die alone. And number two, he wanted to, I guess, make it easier on his relatives to uh, appear to be religious, that he would have, that he did have a minister, so they would uh, not think that he was, uh, you know, an atheist or uh, someone who's totally AWOL from the faith and has not come back. He had a, he had a family, very dedicated, committed, many of those that I met, to Jesus Christ. And yet when I began to talk to him about the Lord uh, and talk to him about eternity, heaven, hell, uh, our sins and how they cling to us and nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ will wash our sins away, he, he just sort of had a mocking smile. He said, yeah, yeah, I know all that. I've done all that. I lived under that. I was raised under that. I know all that. And I said, well, you're here. Where are you with God? You're, I mean, you're going you're gonna to go out. You're going to face God. You have an appointment. It's appointed unto a person once to die, and then after that, the judgment. You're going to face God, and you know when you're going to face God. And he said, listen, I just want you to be here. I don't want to die alone, and I don't want my family to think that I don't believe. And absolutely nothing I said was uh, met with a listening ear, a humble or sincere heart, all with a mocking smile and uh, a little laughter there. And so I began to pray for him. Uh, the days as they came closer. I got to meet some of his family, wonderful people, elderly. Um, I believe it was an uncle who was a, a minister, a, a preacher, very faithful man of God. Uh, I talked with him quite, quite a bit the last few days, very, very capable of handling the Word of God and, and under, you know, presenting the Word of God, just a, a man you would be impressed with. Let me give you some of the background of this individual. There's a long, long history of crime and violence and, and really, really hurting people. Uh, the crime that put him on uh, death row, he kidnapped a 19-year-old woman. She was abducted at gunpoint after getting out of her car at her family's residence. He forced her into the trunk of her car, closed it, and drove the vehicle and drove the vehicle out. He threatened to kill the woman unless he could get some money. Uh, she told him her cash card, uh, credit card cash limits were full, and she could not remember her PIN number. And uh, she suggested that he take items from her home and pawn them and get money. He returned the woman to her home and pointed his gun in her face. He said, do you see this? Anything goes wrong in here, and I'll kill you and anyone else. As they walked into the home, he's looking for items. He ultimately takes a couple of television sets, a recorder, a Nintendo game, things like that. But this lady's uh, brother and a friend of his return home. And as the men saw this intruder, they ran, and he, this criminal... I'm going to call him Francis, if I haven't already said that, shot this brother in the back, and he did die from his injury. That is the crime that put him on Texas death row. He was arrested later. Uh, they obtained a video confession. He led officers to the murder weapon, and the examination of the weapon confirmed the bullet recovered from the deceased was fired from Francis's gun. And during his punishment phase of his trial, a lengthy and violent criminal history was brought forth. Uh, assaults, homicides, kidnappings, robberies, and rape. He uh, started his crime spree early in life. He tried to steal a shuttle bus. The cops apprehended him after a 10-minute chase, and he was sentenced to six months in the county jail for theft. A uh, lady, I'm thinking, what, three, six months later, 
noticed that her car was missing from her driveway. Later that night, the police spotted the car, arrested the driver, and he was sentenced to three years in state prison for unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. And he looks it looks like he did serve those three years. A, a police officer stopped him for jaywalking, found that he had a pistol and ammunition. He was sentenced to 70 days county jail for carrying a weapon. And then we have about a year later, he drove away from a gas pump at a convenience store without paying for gas. He became stuck in traffic. The store owner caught up with him. And then he stepped out of the car, punched the owner in the face. The owner identified him in a photo spread in open court as the person who had robbed him. He shot an individual during a robbery attempt in a parking lot of an apartment complex. Uh, we have a month later from that, that crime, he was driving a vehicle that bumped into the rear of a car driven by a woman. When the woman asked for his insurance papers, he threw the woman to the ground and pointed a gun at her head. He took a ring from this lady, hit her several times, fled after the woman started screaming, and another woman came outside of her apartment and said she was calling the police. Uh, it looks like about three weeks after that, he pointed a gun at a woman as she got out of her car at an apartment complex, took her purse. He then gave... See, then he made her get into the trunk of her car, drove off the vehicle, later pulled over and raped the woman and then ran off. It looks like six days later, he shot and killed uh, a male, young male in an apartment complex parking lot uh, in the early hours or early morning hours. And he robbed another man at, an, at the same apartment complex. Looks like about... 37 days later, a man got out of his car in an apartment complex parking lot. He confronted him. This is Francis demanding his money and keys and then locked the man in the trunk of his car. And seven, eight days later, an apartment security guard was making his rounds at midnight and he was stopped by Francis at gunpoint at Francis' direction. The security guard turned around and ran and Francis fired three shots, hitting him in the back. The victim survived. And we have 13 days later, he shot a uh, security guard, of course, in a apartment complex. And he searched for this individual's money. This uh, officer, security officer, survived. On the same day, he jumped out of a car, robbed a man in an apartment complex parking lot. He told the man to run. The man got in his car and drove away. The man later stopped the car and found a girl in the trunk of the car. This was Francis's car. I didn't say that. The girl told the man that she had been robbed and raped. And then it looked like about 20 days later, of course, apartment complex, parking lot. He pulled a woman from her vehicle at gunpoint took her money and drove off in her vehicle. After forcing her into the trunk, the woman was able to get out about 30 minutes later. Uh, the next day, he robs a man who was walking to his apartment in a parking lot. The same day, uh, he shot another individual in the head, and this man was found in a parking lot, apartment complex parking lot, uh, he did not survive, and on and on we can go. Uh, I think they've got him for three murders, suspicious of a couple of others, and he is waiting trial. He is in numerous fights with other inmates and has more charges added to him. When he was... Uh, in prison, he ran up many disciplinaries and was just a total reprobate, just just totally out of control, totally rude, crude, disrespectful to other inmates and officers. I know all that. I didn't know it going in, and I don't really like to know 
someone's crimes as I am ministering to them. I, I don't want to that to have any influence on me. So I'm better off not knowing this stuff. I've read this stuff later, afterward. So, again, Francis wants me to be there, and I hammered him. I witnessed to him. I talked about a lot about hell, talked a lot about the punishment of hell and how it was eternal, and that uh, I couldn't imagine anyone that was giving the information that I was giving him would still choose hell. And you might say, well, he didn't choose hell. Well, folks, if you don't choose Jesus, you choose hell. There, The choices are here. It's yes to Jesus Christ, no to Jesus Christ, or not now. Now, a not now is a no. It's a delayed no, but it is a no. You know, the question we can ask anyone in this world, rich, poor, whatever gender or background, what are you going to do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus Christ? You've got to do something with him. I mean, there's no avoiding Jesus Christ. You put him out of your mind, uh, he still exists. He's still real. He's still the Savior of the world. Uh, you can deny him. Again, you can put him out of your mind. You can restrict everyone around and say, I don't want to hear any of the, that gospel stuff, or and I don't want to hear that name uttered in my presence, that name Jesus. And, and you can have success there. No one will talk to you about Jesus, and you won't hear his name. You won't hear uh, the salvation message. But you will have done something with Jesus. And so what are you going to do? With Jesus, and I pressed Francis about that, and he would laugh and say, "Hey, uh, as as far as the, as far as this can be taken care of, I took care of that as a kid." He did reveal to me that he sang in youth choir at his church. He was in a uh, youth group, and that he knew all the language of the church. He knew how to give his relatives what they wanted to hear. And uh, his precious uncle uh, questioned him. I'm assuming not through phone calls, but through letters. And he would he would feed his uh, his uncle, his precious uncle. He would feed him a line, if you will, a line of bull, a line of fluff. And it because relatives want to believe that their relatives are right with God if they, in fact, are Christians, and so. You'll believe that. And someone's thinking right now that I'm judging Francis. No, I'm judging fruit. A uh, fruit, uh, a good tree brings forth good fruit. A bad tree, bad fruit. And if it is consistently bad fruit, it's not a good tree. This is not rocket science. You go to a peach orchard, you see a peach tree, it does not produce apples. It produces after its kind. Lost people produce dark deeds. Christian people, although they fall, they stumble, we deal with the temptation of sin every day. Paul said, uh, there's, this, there's this war waging in me in Romans 7. The good I want to do, I don't do. and The bad I don't want to do, I do. And yet, there is still fruitfulness. The struggle is real. The battle is real. It's sort of like this, and I have sinned much since being saved, but God has changed my want to. He's changed my appetites, and when I sin, the Holy Spirit convicts me of that sin, and in repentance, I go to God, I ask for forgiveness, I ask for wisdom and strength to overcome that sin in my life. Now, a lost person has not had their want to change, their desire changed. A real Christian doesn't want to sin. They don't want to live in sin. They do not want the fruit of their life and the testimony of their life to be one of lawlessness, recklessness, uh, carnal deeds, dominated, led by the flesh, all of those ways of saying that. 
Christian people, real, born from above people, are a people in transition. You see, talking about sanctification, that's separation from this world and under God. We are sanctified when we're saved. We've we've been sanctified. We are currently at this moment being sanctified. God's doing a work in us. And tomorrow and in the future, we're going to be sanctified. It's a process. Now, as far as sanctification and in the eyes of the holy court of God, when God looks at you, if you're a Christian, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood covers your sin. It's taken your sin away. away. Without, the, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Your sin's not going to bite you. It's under the blood. We've got to question some things here, folks. There's a toothless gospel being preached. It has, it has no tear of the flesh. It has no ripping of the flesh. It is, uh, has no power. It, if anything, because it's a toothless gospel, it gums. The only hope it's got is to gum the flesh to death. There is no, you call it, say, a diet. It's it's all about, in some places, eating dessert, getting what you want, what makes you feel good, and there's no fiber in that diet. Fiber's not exciting to talk about. You, your doctor will say, you need more fiber. That's that's very boring. God, doctor, give me a pill. That's, that's really boring to talk about fiber. Well, the gospel message, it does encourage Paul said uh, to Timothy, you, you, you do. You preach a message of encouragement. You preach a message of exhortation. But you also preach a message of reproof and correction. And if you don't do that, you're not preaching the whole counsel of God. You're preaching, uh, you're hitting some notes uh, that you want to hit. Like in some preaching today is a pawn shop piano. You ever been around a cheap piano? You uh, every note is stuck, or the strings have become d- uh, detached on the back, and you essentially start hitting the keys, and you find out you've only got two or three keys that uh, that work that produce sound. And so, any song you play, you're going to have to play with, uh, you know, one or two keys, and so you have very limited song there. Everything else is stuck or detached, and so that is not unlike some preaching today. I would say, and if you think I'm harsh, please, you don't have to listen to me. Just move on. Just move on, and I guess I'm on a soapbox some uh, in some sort of way, but a great deal of the preaching today is not prophetic, but it is pathetic. It's It's wimpy. It is wimpy. It's it's not delivered by a man of God. It's uh, it's it's delivered by an actor or an orator who is uh, the goal. The end goal is to please people, to make them simply feel good about themselves. Well, friend, you can feel good about yourself if your sins have been forgiven, and you know your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're headed to heaven. You have within your heart joy unspeakable and full of glory because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God abiding in you. There's great, great joy. You can feel good about being saved. You can feel good about salvation, about the joy of the Lord. Just, just It's just good to know the Lord. But you should not feel good about your sins. You should not feel good about your flesh. And so... Somewhere along the way, you, if you're not, you need to get under the preaching of God's Word. Someone who opens the Bible and they follow what the Bible says. They don't cook up their own thing. They're honest that the Word of God is the Word of God, and they proclaim out of that eternal book. And if it makes you feel good, that's great. But if it cuts your flesh, makes you feel uncomfortable, and makes you look within and take inventory of yourself, that's good too. But if you just go to a place that every week you're at a pep rally or a motivational speech, that is not the church 
of the living God. It may have a steeple on that building. It may have a lectern or a pulpit in that place. It may have a a choir. It could have pews in it. It could meet at 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m., 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. That doesn't make a church. A church, first of all, Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and we are loyal to God's Word. We are faithful to God's Word. And if you do not go to a place like that, I tell you to run. Run. If you went to a grocery store and their shelves were empty, uh, you didn't get what you wanted, you would uh, you would leave the place. And I had a friend uh, lived down in Ruston, Louisiana, and he was telling me he was a, a third-generation person at a particular church. I won't call the name of it. And he did. He he shared with me, I, I don't get fed. There's the, the Bible's just not, it's not like you open the Bible and proclaim from it. It's a, it's just a kind of a little talk that the minister gives. And we talked about that. And I asked him, I said, well, why are you still there if you're not being fed the Word of God? Well, my family's always been there, you know, all that. I understand the ties and the connections. And so I gave that illustration about you go to the supermarket and they have no food on the shelf. You, you, you leave, you come back, and they don't have it. I said, how many times are you going to go back? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, I mean, there's no food. you got to have food for your family. You're going to have to go somewhere else, right? And if they're not going to stock it and they're not going to have it on the shelf, you're, eventually you're going to quit going to that place. And I said, here you're telling me that you're a third-generation person in this church, that the knowledge you have of the Scripture you did not obtain within this church. You, you were saved. He was actually saved at a retreat. And you're telling me, I don't know. I hadn't gone to that place. You're telling me they do not open the Bible and say, this is what God says, and give a message from God's Word. But it's like a talk, a motivational talk. And, of course, he agreed with me. Yes, I said, well, friend, I'm confused. I do not know why you continue to go to that place. Sheep need grass. Find a place where they grow grass, where they grow spiritual grass. Sheep must eat to live and thrive. And so... He's still there all these years later. He does a lot of personal Bible studies and things like that. He's growing in the Lord. Uh, That church has attributed nothing to his growth. And I I hesitate to call it a church because according to the New Testament and the qualifications of a church, it's, I'm sorry, it's just a building. And I know somebody's going to respond to me and uh, email me this week, you are really, really critical in this broadcast. And so if you feel like you've got to do that, you, you go ahead and tell me how critical I am, and I'll uh, I'll weigh what you say. I'll pray about it. I'll be honest uh, with myself about it. I'll be open. But tell me not your opinion. Tell me and use Scripture. I, w- I would love if you need to use Scripture. Show me where I'm wrong about this. And uh, you may not like my manner, the way I address this. That's that's okay. That's that's good. You know, just uh, love me and pray for me. Or if you just it just gets into your crawl too much, just move on down the road. Well, anyway, um, going back to Francis, he was executed. We talked about his final statement. I always go over a final statement. With the inmate, I asked first of all, "Are you are you going to say something? Are you? It's their choice. Are you going to not say something?" And he said, "Yes, I'm going to say something." And he said, "I'm going to I'm going to tell the family I hurt that I'm sorry, and some other things." Well, when he was on the gurney and was given a few minutes there for a final statement. He sort of said he was sorry, and then he sort of took it back, 
And then he went off on this this wild chase where he said he was innocent, and he just sort of listed things he was innocent of, essentially saying, you've got the wrong man, and what I gathered from it is an innocent man is dying tonight. Well, folks, they, they had evidence, DNA, uh Witness IDs, camera, uh, fingerprints, uh, just on and on. Uh, there's no way this guy was innocent. Is he guilty of all the crimes that put him there? I, I have no way of knowing. But he was a guilty, guilty, guilty man. And you would think that facing God, knowing your last breath is is going to be taken, that you would be honest you would be honest. And I tell the men, don't let the last thing you say on earth be from lying lips, and in the next moment you face a holy God with lying lips. I go back to this statement again, though, that sometimes prison ministry and dealing with inmates is like nailing jello to the wall. It is not a clean process. I have been disappointed. I've had my heart broken by some of the weird, bizarre things that have been made in final statements. Uh, I feel some of that personal as I try to work with someone that they would um, would say that which was truth and speak to the family, man up, if you will, about it. And yet many times that's not the case. On the flip side of that, I've seen much remorse in various lives. Pray for Chi-Town. I bring that back because he is, like I said, he's he's out there. I'm not sure what's going on. He does need your prayers. And I appreciate your stopping by. I appreciate your love for God. And let's uh, let our best days be our last days. Let's rejoice in the Lord. And whether God calls us home today or tomorrow, let's be joyful in the King. Jesus is Lord. I love you. God bless you. We'll talk again. And that concludes our broadcast today. Please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, check us out at our Facebook page or at brevistalk.com and take a look at our blog. And remember, be kind. Always be kind.